For those who don't know me, I'm Mike Clarity, and I work in the Office of Communications and Marketing uh, and am joined by Dr. Fred Cam. He's the director of the Auburn University Medical Clinic and Dr. Kimberly Braxton Lloyd, Associate Dean in the Harrison School of Pharmacy. Uh, if we could, I'd like to do it once around the room um, with the student media reps, um, let you guys introduce yourselves and who you're with. So um, since I think everybody probably has a different order on their computers, I'll start top left on mine with Sydney. Hello, um, my name is Sydney Bowden. I am the campus life editor for the Glomerata. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Auburn Managing, or majoring in management and marketing. Super, okay. How about Jack? Hi, I'm Jack. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of the Auburn Plainsman. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Is it Ivanthi? How do you pronounce that? Yes, my name is Ivanthi. I also work on the Glomerata with Sydney. I'm the I'm one of the two copy editors. Um, and yeah, I'm I don't have like a marketing major. I'm here for fun. But um, I'm really interested to see what we talk about today. Super. Super. All right, Evan. Yeah. Hey, I'm Evan Mielens. Uh, I am a managing editor at the Plains. Great. And Collins. Hey, I'm Collins Keith, um, assistant campus editor at the Plainsman. Awesome. Uh, Lainey. I am Lainey Mayfield. I am a reporter for Eagle Eye TV and I'm a journalism major. Awesome. And Ainsley. Hi, I'm Ainsley Ehlers. I'm a reporter for the news team for Eagle Eye TV, and I'm a communications major. Awesome. Paige, you want to introduce yourself too? Um, I'm Paige Patterson. I work for Dr. Rex and Lloyd. I'm not skipping anybody here. I see you on there. So, well, you guys all have the fun jobs. I remember the days of, of student media way back when, and um, I, I, I know you enjoy what you do. It's a lot of fun. And um, I just want to say that the idea today, uh, getting you guys together um, before I let our experts introduce themselves, uh, is really just find out more about Auburn's um, current situation with COVID-19. Um, and I'll start out by being real honest. Um, we need your help uh, communicating our key messages and information back to students. Uh, for example, the mask issue, um, you know, our mask policy calls for everyone to wear masks both indoors and outdoors, and we've not seen a level of compliance that we'd like. Um, so, you know, a push from you guys would go a long way, be a huge step, I think. Um, maybe some students don't know the guidelines. So we'll talk some about that today, but thanks in advance for your help, you know, sharing that message. But I also want you to be aware of some of the other things we have, some other programs, um, such as our Let's Test Sentinel testing program and our vaccine efforts. And um, Dr. Kim, you want to start out, maybe um, tell us what students need to know about the vaccines or um, just kind of an overview of anything you'd like them to know before we open up for Q&A. Uh, perfect. So thanks, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, be more than happy to answer your questions later on. So real quickly, um, we there are two vaccines that are presently being administered uh, in a mass situation across the country. That is the Pfizer, BioNTech, and the um, Moderna, okay? Uh, both of them are being given, uh, they vary a little bit in their dosing schedule. Pfizer's 21 days, uh, Moderna's 28 days. They differ in how they stored. Pfizer needs a ultra cold uh, freezer situation, which fortunately we have the ability to do. Uh, and then Moderna, you can use a regular refrigerator. Uh, soon there's going to be at least probably two more vaccines that get uh, approved, not licensed. None of these are licensed. Uh, uh, two more vaccines that will get approved probably by the FDA within the next uh, couple of weeks or so um, that, that will have a different schedule on, on dosing and how many doses also. Um, you know, we were very fortunate uh, and very uh, proactive uh, back in October and November, working with public health, requesting vaccinate, uh, vaccine doses, uh, you know, having a plan, all of that stuff was in place. Not everybody was as proactive. And now they're finding out that uh, that that 
has worked somewhat to their detriment. Um, we received 3,500 doses on January 6th at about 9 a.m. in the morning. We were given vaccine, put in shots in people's arms by about 3, 3.30 that afternoon. And we've been doing it consistently. We worked uh, cooperatively with the Harrison School of Pharmacy, with the, um, uh, the School of Nursing and the Department of Social Work. We've also had volunteers from other entities, including the Southern Union uh, Community College nurses. And we've stood up a mass vaccination site on the third floor of the Coliseum, which has been working, uh, quite frankly, incredibly well. At this point in time, we have given out 5,317 uh, uh, first doses. 5,317 first doses. Know that even before this pandemic, we already had a plan in place called a close, a close pod plan, uh, emergency plan that was already in place uh, to execute exactly what we've executed. We have another plan called an open pod. That's when we get into more community vaccination and stuff. So this is stuff that you know we had pre-planned and everything. We had to tweak the plan obviously because of this virus and the specific of these vaccines. Uh, so we've done that. Um, you know, as fast as we get uh, uh, vaccine doses from the state, uh, because there's no other way for, for us to get them. I can't, we can't go to the commercial market to Moderna or Pfizer or somebody and buy doses. It's not possible. So we are at the mercy of what is allocated by the state, who are at the mercy of the federal government, what's allocated to them. And the federal government is at the mercy of the manufacturing companies based on how many doses they can produce and when. So everybody's kind of going, going down that process. So, uh, so I'll stop there about the vaccine and um, I don't know what else you would like me to comment before we take questions. We'll just, um, we'll, we'll leave it at that and come back for questions. How about that? And then um, Dr. Braxton Lloyd, if you have anything you want to add about that before you talk about our um, Let's Test Sentinel program. I, I will add that um, the, the vaccination program, we're using a, um, it's by appointment only. We're not taking walk-ins and we are emailing invitations to schedule an appointment at the appropriate time um, to the appropriate people. Um, and inviting them to schedule the appointment and then giving details about how to, um, where to park, where to go, you know, how to navigate the vaccine clinic. And, um, and, and we have a, um, I would also like to mention that on the COVID Resource Center, um, we have a, a tab that's a vaccine tab that includes information about um, vaccine um, development, safety, monitoring, um, what to do before your appointment, what to do after your appointment, a lot of very useful FAQs and information there that um, is available to the public and to the students so they can go there and get information if they need it. Great. Okay, as testing. Far, as yeah. far as the um, Let's Test Sentinel testing program. Um, as you all know, last semester, we did have a Sentinel testing program on campus, and we collaborated with the University of Alabama, Birmingham, UAB, um, and the Alabama Department of Public Health. They had a Sentinel testing program that was implemented a network of, of universities and college, colleges throughout the state of Alabama. And um, we enrolled in that program and administrated on campus but because we were collaborating um, with UAB, we really didn't have control over fine tuning and customizing the program to meet the specific needs of Auburn University, our students and our faculty and staff. And so it ran into issues, like if we had a technical um, problem, we couldn't go in and correct it and would be responsive to those problems. If, and, um, if there was a, if we wanted to adjust the, the, the way things were, um, the invitations were being sent, randomization process was being done, we did not have that control. So we made a decision in November to, um, to bring that program on campus and use our internal resources. 
and to learn from what happened, you know, our experiences in the fall with UAB and Guide Safe, but also feedback that we received from the students and our faculty and staff, and integrate this in the process to make it a very customized and personal program that met our specific needs on, on campus. And so we are um, coordinating and, and managing that program through the School of Pharmacy, through the clinic we have here, the Auburn University Pharmaceutical Care Center. And um, we're, we're, the program is being, um, is operated in the same location on campus in the Coliseum in the scholarship room on the first floor. And so um, the things that are different from last semester is that we're, um, the, the registration process was very cumbersome and hard to navigate. And we've made that a very seamless approach. You don't have to register in order to be included in the population. Um, everyone um, is already enrolled in the, the Sentinel testing program. So we have um, if, if any student that's enrolled in a class that is taught on main campus is automatically enrolled and all faculty and staff where their primary work address is on main campus or the Auburn Opelika area are enrolled. We have 30,000 eligible people. And so, um, and so we're taking our random sample from that elig eligible group, and then we're sending out invitations to schedule an appointment to whomever is randomly selected each week. And with a link that you click on and takes you to the um, clinic software, scheduling software, and you have a list of times and dates over uh, six opportunities, six days in the next two week period after you're selected to pick a time and um, a day and time that's best for, for the individual. So, um, and then you complete the paperwork and schedule your appointment. You get an appointment confirmation. You come over to the Coliseum Park in the East parking lot and um, run through, it's only a 15 minute process from start to finish. Um, and it's um, very socially distanced. There's a lot of um, precautions and measures that have been implemented to keep everybody safe. Another big difference this semester is that um, the, the, cell, the test is not self-administered. It's a clinically approved, EUA approved antigen test. That's a rapid test that we're using. And um, because it's a clinical EUA approved test, it has to be administered by a healthcare provider or healthcare provider training. And so we're using pharmacy students and nursing students to administer the test. Also the Masters of Social Work program students are helping with clinic flow and organization and contact tracing for those that test positive. So it's very interprofessional environment. The, um, the test is a, um, a nasal swab. And so it goes one inch to one and a half inches within the nasal cavity and the, the, the nasal cavity swabbed on both sides before, and then uh, we process the test on site. Um, the patient leaves and uh, we give same day results and notify the patient of their results the same day. And also, um, and this is much quicker. Last semester, it could take anywhere from um, 48 to um, 72 hours or longer to get the results. So we couldn't act on the positives immediately. Now we're able to conduct contact tracing and respond to the needed isolation and quarantine measures very soon afterwards. And um, for late appointments, it might be the next day before we are able to contact the um, patient and do, conduct contact tracing, but it's much quicker than it was last semester, which allows us to be very um, nimble and responsive to the needs on campus so that we can keep the campus safe. Now, um, the, I think one thing that the students will be very interested in is that we are uh, giving free giveaways to everybody that comes through and participates. You have your choice of a very stylish um, navy blue and orange um, let's test of a t-shirt, a face mask, or a lapel pin. That goes to everybody. And, uh, th and so th th then also, this is what I think is going to be catch people's attention, especially the students, is that every single person that participates and completes the whole process, shows up for the appointment, completes the process, their name is entered to a random drawing to get bigger prizes. And so we, for instance, we have autographed, personalized to autograph footballs and basketballs that the coaches have agreed to provide for us. Um, exclusive tours on campus like the Sanford Bell Tower and we're trying to get other things that are not accessible on a, in during normal operations or to the normal public, normal students or faculty and staff. Um, 
I'm trying to get my clarity to give me some work with photographic services and get some photo op ops with Abby with a professional photographer or something like that. And um, we have insulated water bottles and gift cards. And so we're getting a collection of prizes that we could um, use for these random drawings. And so I hope that that will um, entice the students to really take that effort to come out and, and participate in the program and because of those incentives. But the biggest thing I think we need to emphasize is that the more we know, the more people that participate and we get a larger population that's involved in the Sentinel testing program, we're able to know what's going on on campus. Our goal is to catch asymptomatic individuals that are positive, COVID-19 positive, but don't know it. And we're monitoring that asymptomatic infection rate on campus so that we can gauge how prevalent COVID is. And we can also, if we notice that there's um, a cluster developing, for instance, in a certain um, area of campus or a certain population, we can int intensify testing and react very quickly. The more we know, the more we can respond, the better it's going to be for the whole campus. And we're, it's going to get us closer to returning to larger gatherings and, and um, you know, group, larger groups and able to do bigger meetings and, and just have relaxation. It's the path to relaxation of some of the restrictions we're under right now as far as meetings and, and group sizes and things such as that. So that's the, the things I would think we really need to emphasize with the students. The, the other thing I think we need to emphasize, we're getting a lot of questions about well, I've already had COVID, so I don't need to participate. Um, or I've been vaccinated, and so they're not interested in what's going on with me. We want everybody to participate. I mean, the only reason, um, even if you've had COVID in the past or if you've already had your vaccine, everybody needs to participate. The only reason you wouldn't participate is if you're sick, you're actively sick. I want you to go see Dr. Cam or your, your, another primary care provider and, and seek medical care testing and, and be on the path to wellness sooner. I don't want to delay it by, by you know, doing population surveillance. You know, I want you to go get that medical care that you need. Or if you're on isolation or quarantine currently, don't come. You know, you're a red screen. You need to stay in quarantine and don't come for that. Those are the only um, three reasons that you're, you're currently infected and you're in isolation. You've been exposed to someone and you're quarantined or you're sick. That's the only time I don't want someone to come. Everybody else, we need to get them out and get them into the Sentinel testing program. It's so important. Our goal is to perform at least 750 tests per week. That would be 2.5% of our full eligible population. That's our goal. And, um, it, and we haven't hit it this week. We only did 462. I need more people and 80% of the eligible are students and we need the students to show up in force. So that's my plug. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a lot of info for both of those programs. Hope you guys were able to pick out some nuggets in that and maybe um, have some questions for both of the experts. So um, who wants to go first? All right, Evan. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Lloyd, I've got a question for you. So during Sentinel testing last week, you know, we tested about 400 people and only two tested positive. So do you think that that 0.5% number is accurate of the amount of people on campus that have COVID-19 right now? Well, you have to remember that we're doing population level testing. So it's randomly selected. And so, um, it's going to be a different positivity rate, for instance, if you then what Dr. Cam's going to see in his testing site when people are responding, they're showing up because they're sick or they know they've been exposed and they they have a reason to be tested. And so um, and then versus the hospital or a clinical practice where you're doing the same. And so I will tell you that we have been monitoring the, the Sentinel testing numbers all last semester. I monitor Sentinel testing numbers throughout the state of Alabama and Mississippi. And so I looked at UAB every week, I compared our numbers to UAB, UAH, um, um, uh, UA, and University of Mississippi. And every week we were, we were running very consistently about the same per, uh, percent positivity that we were seeing, seeing throughout the state of Alabama. And it is much lower than you would see within a clinical setting. So I do think it's representative of, of what's going on. Um, and the other thing I've seen as we increase the sample size, like for the first week of, of, um, of testing, we, we did 
Paige told me we do 252, 262. And we had one positive. And then when we doubled that, we had two positives and we had a little bit higher this week and we had a, a few more, but there is, it, it is um, correlating as we increase that population size. The most important thing is that everybody comes regardless of what their situation is. So that random sampling is truly representative of what's going on. That's the most important factor is to get that random selection and people show up if they're selected. Evan, let me add to that a little bit. So, you know, again, if if let's say we had 400 people last week and we had four positives, and let's say we have 800 people next week and we have 20 positives, you know, and then the following week we have 800 and now we have 50 positives, we are seeing a trend of that we are sitting on a the brink of an outbreak, okay? So then we would take steps to put in additional mitigation steps, everything from saying, okay, I think we need to go back to online for a two or three weeks or something, or we need to, let's go test, you know, two or three of our, all the dorm residents in a particular, in different buildings to get a better idea. So it's a trend, uh, you know, does, does four from this week tell us that that's what the rate is in the population? The answer is no. You know, it's it's not going to be a absolute number per week. It's going to be the the change in the number and the trend over time, and the the who. You know, I mean, if we we ended up with let's say you know four students and they happen to all live on campus, all the positives were on campus, then we'd be concerned about the residents on campus. You know. If none of them were on campus and all were off campus, then we don't think we have a problem on campus. So, so that's how we look at the data. We have to slice and dice it in a lot of different ways. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Angela, jump right in. So Dr. Kim, you talked a little bit about how you, we came into this with a plan about how we were gonna administer the vaccines. And I've been looking on the website and it's looked like we're at the end of phase one and entering into phase two. Do you have any idea what time we're gonna start administering the vaccinations to the student body, like any sort of time frame? I wish I did. Like I told you, it's at the mercy of getting vaccine doses. Um, and right now, you know, the state of Alabama didn't get the number of doses they were promised, and that hasn't happened for a few weeks. Um, so they are trying, they're literally trying to dish out as equitable as possible and still hit the groups that they're most concerned about uh, first. So I get it. Uh, we were very, very fortunate. We were one of a, a handful of edu higher ed institutions to get vaccine. Uh, which has really upset others who didn't get vaccine and they're letting public health know it. Some of them are letting us know it. Um, so, you know, I, I, the answer is I don't know. Um, trust me, my, our goal is really simple. And that is as soon as we get vaccine, start administering because the vaccine does no good if it sits in a freezer or refrigerator. Thank you. I, I I think I have an idea of what you may be alluding to, but um, multiple outlets reported uh, earlier this week that the university is um, under some sort of an investigation from the ADPH. Um, can you talk about uh, why that was, or why that is, and, and kind of talk through what that means? You're not going to like my answer, uh, but I'll give it nonetheless. You know, it came about because we had a reporter from another educational institution who we gave an interview uh, to, uh, that institution did not get any vaccine, okay? And uh, no assurance of when they would get vaccine. And, you know, that reporter made it out like, you know, we were um, violating ADPH's uh, guidelines and rules, which was not true, okay? Uh, everything we've been doing, uh, I have communicated with ADPH on an ongoing basis. So, you know, we had our plan, we explained our plan, uh, we executed on our plan. And we, yeah, we were not, I mean, to be blunt, Jack, probably if we just focused on giving eligible 75 years old within the Auburn University community, which was what the vaccine allotment, whom the vaccine allotment was for, 
we'd probably have given out less than 100 doses out of 3,500 and sit on it for weeks while we wait for others to uh, decrease the age ranges. Instead, we had a plan that focused on first responders and people who are going to have face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and are at higher risk situations. So people who have to serve thousands of meals a day on campus, okay, making the meals as well as serving the meals, people who are working in the security force, uh, the drivers who drive the transit that have thousands of students coming in and out of their buses, okay? Uh, or again, when, when, when the Alabama Department of Public Health makes an announcement on their phases, they're not thinking about the microcosm of a university, okay? They're not thinking about who's serving meals as a first responder or someone who's driving a transit bus or anything like that. They're, they're not, that's not even in their realm at the time. They were aware that we were doing this. They have since released a, a public statement today, uh, basically saying that, yes, we were aware. And, 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 you know, basically Auburn University had our blessing on the process of how they rolled out their vaccination and they, they're doing the right thing. Now, you know, I will tell you that we have been the most effective and most efficient in the state as far as rolling out our vaccine distribution, giving it to people, okay? Uh, we, we, have, we still, we don't have any doses left from our first allocation. We, we blew through those uh, by last week and we're into our second allocation already. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I understand that people are frustrated and unfortunately the frustration builds when those who got the vaccine go on social media and put pictures and comments up, they didn't make life easier for Auburn and they didn't make life uh, uh, easier for the Alabama Department of Public Health. Um, but we're doing the right thing. Uh, we are being, we're doing what we must do to keep Auburn as in-person and open and bring us back to a degree of normality while we're making it safer and protecting, protecting people. So, but that's what, yeah, that's what happened. Dr. Kim, how are you? I have a question. Yes, Selene. Thank you so much for joining us, by the way. Um, I noticed earlier that you said uh, Auburn University was one of the few high institutes that received the vaccine. I wanted to know what was the determining factor in that and what other universities received that? Um, I don't know all the other universities that received. I know our folks across uh, the state received vaccine ahead of us, okay? In fact, they received the vaccine on Monday. They started giving on the Friday. We received it on Wednesday. We started giving it the Wednesday. Um, so uh, I don't know that everybody has, has uh, the, you know, done their part. What, what I think uh, uh, allowed us to get vaccine is that, you know, we had a plan. We had the facilities. We made this very easy for ADPH. You know, we had an ultra cold freezer. We identified that early. To be able to get that ultra cold freezer, we had to source it within the university's research entities. One that was empty, available, working, and certified by a technician. And the certification had to have been within, um, I think, three months and stuff. We had all of that. And we had to file paperwork, pictures of the, of the, uh, of the freezer. We had to do all the things. That we had to jump through a bunch of hoops to do that. And we did do that. Okay, we purchased the new refrigerator and we put it in place. It had to be in a secured situation. So it is, it's in a 24 hour secured uh, camera monitored situation. So we've got everything in place and I think that allowed it. Other people didn't have their ducks in a row and because they didn't have a du their ducks in a row, they, they weren't able to get, or they, some of them never even requested. Um, you know, we requested and it was a process you had to request it through a state database. So we didn't just request it through the state database. We literally talked to someone at the state, I wanna say every day or every other day, starting back in late November, uh, early December, right through the holidays. They had my cell phone, my head nurse's cell phone, because if they were gonna give us an allotment over the Christmas break, we were willing to take delivery of it. We were going to come to campus and meet the FedEx or whomever and take delivery. We were not going to be, we made this as simple as possible. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. No problem. I know I'm sounding kind of passionate, but uh, I got a lot of um, I got a lot of uh, unpleasant emails from other people in other institutions yesterday. Laney, I would add to that is that we another thing that ADPH is monitoring is how successful the organization or the the physician practice the providers are, are getting the doses in the arms. Are you administering them? Are you documenting that you administer it within 24 hours so that the state knows where that dose went? And are you wasting any doses after you thaw them? And we are batting a thousand on that. We are yeah. so attentive to every part of this. And the reason we got the second allotment because we administered the first allotment and you have to have it cross a certain threshold before you can get your ne next, make your next request. So it is the success of the implementation, the supply, the IT needs, the supply chain needs, the, the compliance and um, the clinical organization and clinical implementation of our closed pod plan. And um, that has been noticed by ADPH. And that success has led to the doses coming our way. And also, I'll just add, uh, we're very proud of the fact we have not wasted a single dose. Not a single dose was thrown away or wasted or anything. So we didn't have to dump any because, you know, that, that, that refrigerator and freezer is being monitored, not just by technology, but by people twice a day. Twice a day, we go in and check it. Uh, not that we don't believe in technology, we do, but we're making sure, and that's seven days a week. Okay, Saturdays and Sundays. So one of us is going in and checking that freezer and refrigerator for the temperatures and make sure everything's okay and, and stuff like that. So we're doing all that we have to do. Thank you all both for answering the question and thank you for joining us again. No problem. Hey, Dr. Kim, I had a question for you. Um, so I know you mentioned about the uh, time frame that um, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, you know, in between the first and second dose. Um, and, you know, you've said that there has not been, um, it's not been easy to, to, to know when you guys would be getting the next set of doses or the allotment of doses from, from Alabama, since that's, it sounds like it's a little bit out of your control um, when that comes. Um, I would just want, wanted to know and like to ask um, if everyone who has already gotten a vaccine, a first dose at this point, is that an assured thing that they will have a second dose in that allotted time frame? Is that something that's under your control that you know about? So Collins, that's going to be dependent on the delivery of vaccine. Uh, to be blunt, um, I, uh, we received a second allotment of 3,500 doses, uh, which were for second doses. But that meant we were gonna sit on vaccine for about three weeks almost before we gave another dose. And so the decision was made by a committee, which I am definitely uh, a big proponent of that we were going to take a little bit of a risk and we're going to take half of that second dose allotment and continue administering vaccine over the next two weeks, which is we're at the end of it this week uh, with as first doses. So we did that. Okay. And we hope that that triggers the uh, Alabama Department of Public Health to give us an additional allocation. But right now, uh, we will start second doses next week, okay? We have enough doses to do the second doses for the next two weeks. So we basically bought ourselves about two to three weeks of sitting and doing nothing with vaccine. So it's going to roll right into each other, you know? Uh, either we're going to look like we were brilliant or we're going to have some upset people, half of the first people who got the first doses upset with us if we don't get any allocation within the next uh, two weeks, two, almost three weeks from now uh, for those second, those second half of those second doses. So um, I still think it's the right thing to do. The vaccine is not doing any good sitting in a refrigerator or freezer. And if I could just add on to that, um, what would be the amount of time that you could wait in between doses to where the second would be effective? I mean, what's the time frame for we're looking at that? Perfect question. The answer is anytime for the Moderna vaccine, which is what we gave, anytime after 28 days. How far past 28 days, we don't know. That was not what was studied, but there is data that shows that you can do it later. 
when the decision was made that 28 days should be when the second dose should be given, that was based on the studies that were done. And they found that the 28th day was the shortest, shortest optimal time to give the, the second dose. Okay. So, you know, they could have made life easy if they had just found everybody says do it after 21 days and all the vaccines look like that. That's not what was happened. So anytime after 28 days, so it could be 28 days. It could be, you know, two weeks after that, six weeks after that, you know, you can give it later. You just can't give it earlier. Okay. I'll kind of shift this. Uh, I'll kind of shift this subject a little bit. So with the Guamarada, we um, are mostly covering December and back for this issue. And so, um, a lot of our questions and things that we want to know have to do more with student life, um, whether that be from the beginning of the pandemic to now. So my question that I wanted to ask is um, students are just stressed right now. That's just a fact at this point in time, more than any other times in our recent history. And so we wanted to know what the university is doing to counteract prevalent mental health issues among its students. And also what you learned from last semester about student experiences in mental health and how you're applying that to upcoming initiatives and resources. Sure. So I'll, I'll try to answer that. Uh, I am not in charge of counseling. So that's the first thing. But I will tell you that they've brought on, uh, you know, they switched to, to uh, the telehealth counseling process. Uh, they had to get through some licensing and, and uh, technology because, uh, as you know, uh, when our students were told that what they were going to do remote, some of them went home, which meant they crossed state lines. Well, there, there, are, uh, there are laws against practicing uh, uh, across state lines. So they had to get through some of those uh, hurdles to be able to do this, but they were able to set up telehealth. They were able to set up uh, uh, other entities available. Uh, so, so that was very much the case and has continued, sir. So. You know, we're going to try and switch back more towards some in-person counseling and groups and stuff. They did do Zoom groups and all of those things. Obviously, with telehealth, it becomes a bigger issue of HIPAA compliance and privacy. Okay. Uh, so that had to play into it too. Um, so yeah, so, so what did we learn? Uh, we learned that uh, remote learning uh, didn't work for everyone and some people struggled. Uh, we learned that, that students were having uh, more uh, isolation, stress, and other issues related with remote learning. And that's why we made a determined effort to try and bring Auburn back to closer to more in-person learning, not just learning in the classroom, but also organizations, you know, because there was a period there where y'all couldn't even come in your offices. Now, I believe you're allowed back in, you've been allowed back in your offices. You got to wear masks. You still got to make an effort to keep distances. You can have events up to 50 people. All of those things have been changed. And as the trends continue, that 50 people per event might go to 100 or 250. We'll see, you know. Uh, we are very, very sensitive and aware, but we're going to do what's in the best uh, interest of health and safety. Now, we can't make everything safe. We can make it safer. And that's what we're working towards. So, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, you mentioned earlier... Um, remember who it was that mentioned it but uh the uh lack of mass compliance um that uh i mean that's an issue that's visible to what do you attribute it to like do students not know that they should be wearing masks are they refusing to um and with that um if that continues do you think it's safe for students to begin um having more in-person classes um in the next couple weeks okay so by a show of hands, how many of y'all don't know you're supposed to be wearing masks when you come on campus? So everybody knows, right? So it's not a matter of not knowing, it's a matter of it's uncomfortable, I don't like it, I don't need it, you know, uh, I don't feel the same need to protect 
other people around me. It's not a big deal. You know, young people are not having a big problem with this virus. So on and on and on, I can go. I, I don't know all the reasons. Some, some say it's political. Some say it's the constitutional right and all those things. At the end of the day, okay, the most effective mechanism we have that's easily available to reduce the spread of a respiratory virus is wearing a mask, okay? We have not, we have not seen a flu outbreak anywhere in the world, okay? And why is that? Because of the precautions we've taken for COVID, okay? So masks work. Uh, we know masks work. And, uh, you know, which mask and all that sort of stuff, you know, uh, we just want people to cover their faces and you're going to see more, more and more announcements coming out from the federal government, public health and at Auburn about improving the type of masks that you wear. Because these new variants that are coming out are more, it appears more transmissible, uh, which means masks are going to be even more important. The virus didn't shrink in size, okay? It's just the transmittability of it. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we have to work on, on, on creating a culture. You know, if you saw people, again, if you saw other students walking across campus naked, all right, would it draw your attention? Would you say something? Would, would somebody get called? Yes. Why, why can't we look at the mask like a piece of clothing, okay? If you walked in, if I were a professor and you were, you were, I was teaching a class and you walked in without, without a shirt and shoes, I probably will not let you sit in that class. Okay. I'd say, you know, I don't think this is appropriate for my classroom right now. Well, why is that so difficult with a mask? I, I, I just struggle to understand that, you know, we're not asking people to, to, to pick up a, a, a gun and go to war or go to battle. We're asking them to put on a mask, okay? That's all we're asking. It's that simple. And we're making it more complicated than it has to be. And uh, yeah, it's disappointing. I'll be honest. It's very disappointing. It's very frustrating for us in healthcare. Okay, very frustrating. Because like right now, I've got a couple of people being infused with monoclonal antibody. That's why I was looking at my phone. And, you know, I've got nurses who are gowned up with, with, you know, head covers, gloves, gowns, you know, N95, everything, put in an IV in a patient that's known to have COVID. And we're thinking that that was preventable, but if some people had just worn their mask. So it's very frustrating. And we're not seeing the worst of it. My colleagues who are working in intensive care units, watching people die in front of them by themselves without family members are struggling emotionally. And this is a preventable virus. It's preventable by wearing masks, sanitizing your hands, uh, physically distancing, and avoiding large group gatherings. It works. It's just people seem to be struggling with this. So yes, I struggle to understand it. Because like I said, if you came in without pants or underwear into a class, somebody will say something to you. Well, why not a mask? I, don't, I just don't get it. When that, that's the second half of the question um, is because you're right. There is, it's for some reason harder for people than it should be. Um, we know that bars are still open downtown. Um, with that reality, do you think that having in-person classes uh, or having the in-person or the online option end um, in, I think, a week's time. Do you think that that's a, a safe decision? I think it's a safe effort, okay? I think that if we, if we enforce what should happen, and that is people wearing masks across campus, indoors and outdoors, consistently wearing it, and that we have students distance in the classroom, okay? I think it can be done safely. It's being done safely, okay? Auburn isn't, Auburn isn't, you know, on the bleeding edge here. Other people have done it safely. So it can be done safely. Um, you know, what's the right timing? You know, again, there is no, how should I put it? There is no playbook to say that this is the time, all right? 
We're watching the data every single day, multiple times a day, and it's going to be a judgment call. Okay, our purpose is not to put people's life at risk. That's not the oath that Dr. Kimberly Braxton Lloyd or I took when we got our professional degrees. Okay, so we're not trying to put anybody's life at risk. And you know what? We've said to the faculty that if you have an underlying health problem that makes you vulnerable, you need to work with your department chair and others to determine what's the best way to teach your course and or can someone else teach your course and you teach their course because that course is more uh, suited to being remote. But it's really hard to teach organic chemistry lab remote or, or a lot of labs remote, okay? It's hard for a, even, even hard for not just science majors, you know, theater majors and others. It's really hard for them to, to continue along their matriculation. We've got geology students who are going to need to get their degree. And part of their degree being accredited is that they must do an outdoor uh, lab. And that got canceled last summer because we were, in the, we were in so much of the unknown of a pandemic. We're working hard to make that happen so that these students can graduate on time with their degree and move on and find jobs and start their life. And, you know, all we're asking is we get through the right matriculation, people do the preventive strategies, wear their masks, sanitize their hands. Yes, we would love for them to avoid downtown bars, but we have no control what happens across the street. Okay, And at the end of the day, we have no control whether students, once they leave campus, wear masks or not. We do have control on campus. We can create a culture. Okay, Auburn has a culture of people who are uh, respectful and caring and stuff. That's, that's part of why some people came to Auburn. And wearing a mask indoors and outdoors could be the new culture, but we have to make it contagious. This is a place you all can really help us. I, you know, the social responsibility, being taken responsibly for your decisions and helping us um, keep the campus safe. Not only what happens on campus, but what's happening off campus. And thinking about decisions you make and things you participate in, in for, for everyone. I have a question. Yes. Um, so, a few days, a couple of days ago, there was a dangerous and disturbing revelation that three new variants uh, were discovered in the United States. And we only thing that we do know is that they are highly contagious, but a lot of information has not been released to the public for various reasons. What are some things that you all know about the new variants? How should college students respond to this? And how should we protect ourselves? Great question. It doesn't matter what the variant is, it's the same virus at the end of the day, you know? So the preventive measures are the same, exactly the same. Wear a mask. Now, like I said, in the, in, in the next couple of weeks or so, you may start seeing people saying, you know what? Y'all need to be far more cognizant of what kind of mask you're wearing, okay? Those little neck gaiter things and people taking a bandana and putting it over their face, that's not it. Okay, uh, there are criteria. These criteria have existed way back from March and April of last year, where it says, you know, you need a multi-layer cloth mask. You just can't use a, a, a one-layer thing. You know, uh, there are different levels of masks, you know, like some of you all are wearing surgical type masks. N95 is the gold standard, okay? Um, but N95s, for someone who has worn an N95 quite a bit, okay, uh, in my career, especially early in my career, they're very uncomfortable, okay? Uh, they're very difficult to talk through. So all of those things you have to take into account. So I think you'll see that change. But the variants, same virus, spread the same way, respiratory, pretty much. It's just the big question is how much more transmissible it is. In other words, is it more contagious? Okay, like we know COVID is more contagious than the flu, right? So is it more contagious? Is it uh, deadlier? Does it come with more complications? 
and are the vaccines going to work? Okay, uh, because of where some of these uh, mutations. So uh, viruses mutate all the time. We've dealt with this for history. Okay, that's why even though this is a coronavirus, which in humans normally cause the common cold, okay, this is a cousin to that. Uh, we've never had a vaccine against a coronavirus for humans until this one. Because viruses mutate. We expected mutation. In fact, this virus has mutated more than 4,000 times already. That's logged in. There are 4,000 mutations that have been, uh, been logged in. But these new variants, especially the one from South Africa, appears to have happened on a certain part of the spike protein which the spike protein is how the virus binds on certain receptors in the respiratory tract and the lung and stuff like that. And that's the one of concern because it might affect how effective the, the vaccines are and it might affect how effective some of the drugs we're using are. So, but it's too early to tell. You know, it's too early to tell because... The worst thing you can do is go out and give information and then have to walk it all back, okay? So you wanna make sure you have the scientific data, you wanna make sure it's reviewed by the scientists and the experts, and then they can make a decision on you know, what they can say that is factual and scientifically um, based, all right? But there are, there are at least uh, three, four, there's four variants, but three are hitting the news right now. Okay, and the variants will increase because more as more and more millions of people get infected with the virus, every person it infects, it has the potential to mutate and create a variant. So that's why we're seeing variants now because we're now over you know the hundred plus million people who've been infected and stuff like that. So we're going to see there is a U.S. variant that is being studied. So, so there's a U.S. variant, the Brazilian variant, the uh, British variant, and the South African variant. There's also a Denmark variant. There, there's a few other variants. Just some of them are inconsequential. Others are of concern. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so, okay. My question is about like university branding, kind of, um, which I don't know if you guys will be able to help me out with, but like in the interest of the fact that you all are talking to student media leaders in order to kind of keep university messaging consistent. I know that I have talked to other students about how like policies change all the time. And I understand that this is a day by day, minute by minute type situation. But I was just wondering like with what is this like almost a year of experience in like having to do that what are some methods maybe going forward that you guys are trying to implement in making that messaging or those policies more consistent so that they're like easier to get out to students? Sure. So I will, uh, I'll, I'll give my clip and then Mike probably has more to say. I will say the following. I respect Mike a lot. He does a great job in his job. Okay. But to be blunt, you all are the experts at getting stuff out to students. Okay. Because you understand, you live it, you understand how they think, what they look at. You know, I'm not an Instagram guy. I don't tweet, okay? Um, I had to get off Snapchat because my phone was going off too much. I have other things going off on my phone that are way more important. So Snapchat's off, okay? Um, you all are better at this than we are. And you know what? In a lot of cases, we may have the expertise. You all have the credibility, okay? So... You know, we're not trying to use you. Don't get don't get the wrong idea. You know, um, you could you could you could say something that works against us. You could say something that works for us. At the end of the day, we're all working for the same thing, right? And that's to make Auburn safer, and to get people to be able to matriculate successfully and get their degrees and move on and make friendships and relationships. That's what we're we all want the same thing at the end of the day, you know. But you all are the experts. You know, it doesn't matter whether we say let's test or we do this or we put up new colors, you know, that's just visual things. At the end of the day, whether the message is delivered, y'all are the experts. Mike. 
<laughs> yeah, I have to agree with that. And and I think somebody brought it up before, you know, there's just, there's no playbook for this. No one in the world has a playbook for this. Um, and I think higher ed institutions have a unique environment in a whole different set of needs amongst their constituents. I'm talking about those of you all and uh, the faculty and those who are on campus every day, you know, it's a small city and we're trying to make sure that we, we're doing the best we can for everybody who is here. Um, and, and Fred's right, there is there is um, so much that you guys can do. And I'm not talking about you as student media reps, I'm talking about student to student, just peer to peer uh, that really helps with messaging. When you, whether or not you report anything out of this today, uh, when you go back and you know, you're reading something that's in, you know, the, 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 the news media, large national media. And if it's something that applies, you know, and you share that, that has a big impact on your peers. Uh, what you say, and especially as student news leaders, your, your voice is very loud. People look to you for, you know, what's going on? What's the real story here? They think that you're the ones who are plugged in, you know, and, and I would take that role very seriously. Um, yeah, we hope that you go back and report great things today. But like Dr. Cam said, you know, we want you to be honest. I mean, there are some things that you know you may pull out of this conversation that you know we may have we may do, want to do differently next time. But we count on that honesty and that transparency, and that's why we really wanted to get this group together today um, with Dr. Braxton Lloyd and Dr. Cam, who really are, have been plugged into this every single day. I mean, this goes back before 2020 started. We started thinking about this. We first heard about what's coming. Um, I've worked with both of them for a long time, especially in the last year or so. These guys, they're experts. They get this stuff. They understand it. And we're very fortunate here at Auburn to have them. Dr. Cam talked earlier. Not everyone has had this vaccine. And we're very fortunate here to be ahead of the curve so that hopefully we can keep our, our folks here on campus safe. Um, any other questions about that? Did that answer your question about the marketing um, the question about thing? Yes, I think so. I just, I did want um, information on like what you guys have learned, but I think you kind of answered that in that like you've learned that student to student conversations or faculty to faculty conversations are sometimes more important than like Dr. Cam called them, like those visuals um, that you see up on, on campus. Though those are helpful, like it's really a, a community um, effort. Yeah. Well, you know, we sit here every day, and I know we have bombarded you guys with messaging. You know, I, I was counting um, as we were speaking earlier about the campaigns, the A Healthier You campaign. You know, the Sentinel testing, then the Let's Test, uh, get your flu shot. You know, um, now the vaccine. So we have just bombarded y'all, and it's really hard to cut through the clutter sometimes and, and open every email, right? So um, we know that. So we're looking for you know new avenues to get messaging out. Um, beginning next week, you guys are going to see a lot more messaging about wearing a mask on campus. It's going to be hard to miss, I promise. Um, and we're hoping that um, people will, will heed um, the messaging that Dr. Cam was, was saying here, that it is important. It's really critical. If, if we want to get out of this thing, that's one way to help us get toward a, a, a healthier campus. And, yeah. you know, you want to get back to the health, the, 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 the rec center, you want to have bigger gatherings of more than 50, you know, we all have to do our part. And, and it just, I'm, with him, I'm frustrated when I walk across a campus and I see 30% of the people wearing their masks. We've got to get to a, a higher level of compliance. You know, I got my first, I got my first professional haircut uh, last week uh, since March 14th of 2020, okay? <laughs> uh, because for a number of reasons. You know, not that I didn't think that the haircut in person first people are unsafe. I think they've done a pretty good job of trying to make it safe. But, you know, I could not be seen publicly out getting a haircut every month or every three weeks when I'm telling people, you got to do this, you got to. I have not eaten dinner in a restaurant since March of last year. <laughs> okay. Um, you don't think it's affecting my life? <laughs> um, you know. So, and, and same thing, if we're putting stuff out there that you don't think we're messaging right, or you don't think it's working, tell us. We, we, I'm an ex, I, well, I don't know now I'm an expert. You know, I, I am a medical professional. I don't 
I don't expect to be a journalism or communication or marketing or any of that thing. But at the end of the day, y'all are students. Y'all are, we're, we're more than willing to listen to your feedback, criticism, and suggestions. You tell us what works. We'll be happy to, to make it happen. Yeah, you guys can reach my office anytime. Um, I really appreciate y'all's willing to, one, to attend something like this and ask questions. Um, your interest in telling Auburn's story uh, means a lot. And uh, we appreciate in advance anything you can do to help, you know, tell students about the importance of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, and they're about out of time. Uh, unless anybody has anything, the last question. Um, I'll uh, just thank Dr. Cam and Dr. Braxton Lloyd for their time.